So nowadays we all love a good mystery. People really like trying to decode secret messages. A lot of pop artists today like Taylor Swift hide a lot of Easter eggs or you know messages around her favorite number in their music. But before this was a you know trendy thing to do, a lot of classical music composers actually hid a lot of messages in their music in many different ways and for many different reasons. Either to profess their love to a secret mistress or to fight against a political opponent, or in some cases just because it's good fun to just mess with people. So the most common way of hiding these messages was through what's called a musical cryptogram. That means that they would take the letters that are assigned to the notes and they would use that to write words when they were writing musical melodies or themes. So the most common example of this is Bach, who used to write a lot of music basing it on a musical theme based on his own name. But one person that loved doing this was Alban Berg and there are examples of him hiding these little messages in a lot of his pieces. So for example in his chamber concerto he used the system to roughly write his name, the name of his teacher Schoenberg and the name of his colleague Bevan because all three of them were known as the second Viennese school because they were all following the same trend or type of music writing at the time. But if we want to get a bit more gossipy, we can look at his lyric suite, which was dedicated to his lover. So he was married, but he has this, uh, I don't know if it was like an actual affair or, you know, like a, mm, what do you call it? What do you call it when you don't do anything about it, but you're still in love? Well, I'll write that here. So what Berg did is he used his initials, so A, B, and the name of his lover, which was called Hannah Fuchs, so H and F, to use as the source material for a lot of the motives or the organization within the piece. But he also sprinkles in some number decoding because Berg was obsessed with the number 23. He was sure that important or tragic things were always going to happen on day 23. I think he ended up dying on a day 23. so yearly maybe he was right. So he assigned himself that number in the piece and Hannah the number 10. I don't really know why but in any case and use those two numbers or multiples or those two numbers as uh, tempo references, as amount of bars of certain sections. He used that to construct the whole piece. Now another person that is known for writing pieces that had cryptic messaging is Shostakovich. Now he has used the system of doing a theme based on his own name which is actually really across a lot of pieces. His most important hidden message comes in the fifth symphony and it's one that could potentially have cost him his life. Now Shostakovich was composing under the regime of Stalin. There was a lot of censorship in art and there was a desire for music to represent more Russian values and type of music and everything that was considered too Western was instantly censored. Now at this time around 1930 Shostakovich was already quite established and he had written an opera called Lady Macbeth of Mtensk. This is the third time trying to record that name, which honestly had been performed for two years. Everything was fine. It was a success until one day Stalin decided he wanted to go to a performance, which was very anticipated. Everybody was quite on edge about him being there. And it was not good when he left before the thing finished. It was considered as, you know, not good. And sure enough, through the official kind of newspapers, it followed a review that said that that was model instead of music. Yikes. And Shostakovich was said to be playing a game that may end very badly. They ask you how you are, you just have to say that you're fine when you're not really fine. At that time, persecution and, you know, magic disappearances was quite real. A lot of people in his family had been arrested and then released or had been forced to leave Russia. Shostakovich was writing this fourth symphony that he really liked but he recognized that there were a lot of Western elements or things that they were not going to appreciate in it and so he decided never to present it. At that point the only thing Western that was not banned was Beethoven. So after this situation in 1937 he publishes, he premieres his fifth symphony. And what happened with the symphony is that Shostakovich wrote something that ended up being praised by both pro-government and against government people. Because on the surface he wrote something that was exactly what the government was asking of him, but under the surface people read a very different message. And Shostakovich was so smart doing this. He 
structure the whole symphony kind of mimicking the Beethoven Fifth Symphony, starting in this minor, you know, conflicted manner and ending in this glorious, everything is great uh, manner in the last movement, which was, was, was criticized of him, that when he was writing this conflicted pieces, it was maybe to be interpreted like people here are struggling and are being persecuted. So the government really wanted something that ended triumphantly, all guns blazing, you know, everything is fine and happy and well. And Shostakovich gave them that, in a way. He hid a lot of messages by quoting other pieces that the people would know. So for example, there is a part where he quotes a melody from an opera that everybody would know called Boris Godunov because it was from fellow Russian composer Mussorgsky. And that part of the opera he's quoting is exactly where the people are being forced to give praise to the Tsar. Sort of like, wink wink, I'm being forced here to write a symphony that they're going to like so I don't disappear. And in the fourth movement he quotes himself. He had written a song with a text by Pushkin and he specifically quotes a phrase or a melody of that song that he composed and that specific part is where the song is saying that a barbarian artist blackens over the painting of a genius. So the poem is about a barbarian artist who tries to get rid of the work of a genius and in the end of the poem he doesn't succeed and the work is preserved. So again, this could refer to Stalin. And a lot of people are very emotionally hit by the last movement, which was the key part of the symphony. If he had ended it in the third movement, which is the sad, struggling music, he might have been, you know... But the fourth movement, in the end, ends up very triumphant, timpani, everything is out. But the thing is, this last movement, stays in D minor in this struggling key all the way up to the very end. It almost sounds like the most forced thing in the universe. It is, it's trying to keep the D minor, it's trying to keep it, and then it bursts into this D major. <laughs> major, Shostakovich creeps in some chords that belong to D minor, kind of generating this tension, sort of saying, this is not what it seems, all that pain is still here. And that timpani at the end, it is very, it's not uncommon to have such a humongous timpani presence in the end. But the way this sounds in context, it's so brutal, it really he really is very striking. He really was very sneaky. And now going to a bit of a, you know, lighter case of this secret messaging, we get to the Enigma Variations by Elgar. And this kind of has a bit of everything and it was Elgar having a bit of fun. The piece is a theme and then an amount of variations and each variation is dedicated to one of his friends, but he only wrote the initials of them, which by now people have figured out who was who. But for some of them he also kind of went an extra step. For example, there's one variation which is the most popular called Nimrod, which we now know represents his friend Ye but why is it called Nimrod? Because Jäger in German means hunter and Nimrod is a biblical figure that was also a hunter. So instead of putting the initials of his friend Jäger, he went this extra step. And in a not so fun fact, in Princess Diana's funeral, Nimrod was played because Diana is also a part of the Roman mythology representing the hunt. But in any case, the actual enigma in the enigma variations is not all of this because all of this is sorted, everybody knows who is the friend in each variation. The enigma is the theme. Because when Elgar premiered this piece, he wrote a little text that said that all through the theme there is another secret theme that goes with it. And he said something like, it's dark mystery I will never reveal. Trying to imply that there was another theme that would fit perfectly within the theme that we are actually listening in, you know, the beginning, and that would run perfectly if you played it underneath that one, and that it was a famous one. And that's all he ever said about it. I actually think that the famous part was not said by him, but highly speculated because 
if you're trying to give a mystery and you're trying for someone to figure it out, it can't just be whatever because you could just write whatever and say, oh yeah, that's what he meant. It has to be something that is already known that fits perfectly. And so over the years, musicologists have really worked on this. Some people thought it was God Save the Queen or Rule Britannia. Some people thought it was Twinkle Twinkle Little Star. Some people thought it was a popular song of the time. But I guess we will never know. There's better guesses and worse guesses. And so he had a bit of fun writing that piece. It's also a really great piece. Nimrod is very popular. You might have heard it somewhere. I think it was used for a lot of soundtracks. And that's it for me uncovering the mysteries of classical music. There's actually a lot more people that had a lot of fun writing stuff in the music with this uh, cryptogram. Bach had a lot of fun writing riddles. He would write, you know, canons and only give one voice and then write a bit of a riddle so that you would figure it out. The only issue with that is that a lot of people already did. So when you actually get the score for those canons, for example, in the musical offering, they're already spelled out. So if you know of some other that I haven't mentioned or that, you know, particularly intrigues you, you can, as always, write it in the comments and I will see you guys next time.